Welcome to the Grand Theft World podcast hosted and sponsored by GrandTheftWorld.com. This is uh, episode 69, and this is Soros, NATO, and the New World Order. We're going to cover a lot of news that's happened in the past week. Uh, it's been a dense week for news. We're going to go into some deep dives and some original document findings and look under the covers of some of these censorship issues that we're going to espouse upon tonight. And uh, one of the things we're not going to be talking too much about tonight is the COVID story. It's kind of kind of gone missing. I don't know what happened in the past week, but all of a sudden there's not a lot of COVID news. It's like crickets. Then. There's some new 9-11 footage that surfaced. After 20 years, we're going to look into some new footage. It's very enigmatic. First off, this footage was released the same day as uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine. Okay, And a lot of people are th uh, thinking that even maybe now that you could have uh, you know, something spin out of control into World War III. However, that is interesting on itself. So let's just take a very quick look at this footage here. So I'm not going to play it because I'll link you to the channel. But basically what happens here is you have a plane hitting the towers, right? As you can see there, the plane flying it through the sky into the towers. Now, that's important, obviously, historically, right? So who is Kevin Wesley? Remember, it shows very clearly the planes hitting the towers. Well, apparently, Kevin, if you look at his channel, works in nuclear, okay? For instance, um, this here, if we go to program, you'll see that he, on December the 23rd, 2014, which was the day he, uh, around about the time he retired in 2014, if you look at his uh, retirement there, it says an honor here, uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Kevin D. Wesley, 15th of January, 1992 to the 1st of September 2014 and it goes through um, you know what he was in charge of you know his background you know uh, you know and things of that nature and in that you can see he is someone that uh, you know uh, was an exchange officer at the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense atomic weapons so here you have if you We'll clip it. If you clip on that video, you see Special Programs fly t Flight Test Manager at uh, where? Uh, well, uh, that would be at Las Vegas, Nevada. Where do you test planes at Las Vegas, Nevada? Well, one of the places there, obviously the biggest test range is what? Um, and that's at the Air Force Flight Center there. Uh, one of the places you test flies, uh, planes is actually Groom Lake, right? Groom Lake, Nevada, Dreamland. The intermission later is uh, is a well planned and well thought out expose of some of the machinations going on today. It's going to take you back into a little history, so there'll be some flashbacks from you know eight or ten years ago. You can juxtapose those to what's going on today to see some views on uh, you know history as it unfolds and you're living through it. You might as well have a little context to help you understand how it's unfolding. Regina Dugan came out recently. She's a former DARPA, DARPA head, but she now is the leader of special projects for Motorola, which is owned by Google. And this is, uh, she says, this is a quote, we got to do a lot of epic expletive when I was at DARPA. Uh, and she says, now they're even doing better stuff. And she was showing her electronic tattoo that she has. So it's an electronic tattoo. It's a barcode on her arm. And she was showing that off. And how that can be used to authenticate your password or your authenticate you on online and everything instead of using a password. And she went on to say that they also have vitamin authentication, which is a pill that you swallow and your whole body then becomes your password. It's incredible. And just part of that technology, mm -hmm. I know a lot of it's based on gaming theory. Uh, which probably does play into video games, but I know it principally means being able to predict your response, as you mentioned. And, and that means knowing the most likely options, whether it's two, three, four options, whether it's multiple choice, and basically planning for that response and then in a prioritized a list. I mean, maybe you saw the headline <laughs> from uh, last year in 2012, new algorithm predicts your future movements within 65 feet of accuracy. And they found that essentially we repeat the same basic movements on average over and over, 
go to the same basic corner store, the same job location, the same home or apartment location, same base of friends. And if they're tracking that on your t- on your cell phone or on your Facebook updates or through an implant chip, they can pretty much predict what you're likely to do next as well. We'll also cover the fact that the Washington Times has censored a story that it wrote on its own site. And all of a sudden, about maybe nine months ago, it went missing. It's particularly relevant in context of some of the other news stories that have happened in the past week. Does, is this the Gnomes, <clears throat> the Gnomes article? Yeah. Yeah, you'd be surprised that a, a topic like Gnomes gets taken down Oops. from the Washington Times. <laughs> but The last mention of this before it was scrubbed was May 27th, 2021. So go ahead, LD. Their Geneva counterparts in French-speaking Switzerland were more sophisticated, relaxed in the company of global wheeler dealers, and weren't afraid to speak their minds, albeit off the record. Such was George C. Carl Weiss, the brain behind Bank Privy. Owned by the late Baron Edmund de Rothschild, his biggest claim to fame, George Soros, and the launch of his quantum fund in 1969. So we're going to take a look at why that connection and why that particular article might have gone missing on the Washington's Times site. And then last but not least, we've got uh, these two stories that we're going to cover later. The Interparliamentary Union, founded in 1889. It has a world map that has like everybody's in the club except the United States. It's a, it's an interesting map. The idea of an interparliamentary union foreshadows anything anything that you might know today as globalism or what some might call the new world order. And by some, I mean like H.G. Wells and Princeton's Anne Marie Anne Marie Slaughter, who works at the Council on Foreign Relations, and Robert Kagan, who wrote of Paradise and Power. America and the New World Order. Like, it's not my term. These guys made it up. Last but not least, there's this story that's kind of been floating through the news in the past week. A lot of fog of war on this one. And it is NATO versus Russia. NATO versus Putin, if you want to put it that way. It's a battle that started about eight years ago with the overthrow of Ukraine. And now in the past week has been escalated by some uh, you know, events and activities undertaken by Putin with his, uh, his military regime over there. Tonight, the warning for President Biden that the world is witnessing the beginning of a Russian invasion in Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin has told the Russian people he is now recognizing the independence of two separatist regions of Ukraine. New video shows that Russian tanks are on the move despite the appearance of heavy artillery. Moscow claims that these are just peacekeeping forces. Russia. And little bit of chicken Russia's amassed more than 150,000 troops around Ukraine's borders. Who in the Lord's name does Putin think gives him the right to declare new so-called countries on territory that belong to his neighbors? Focused on their own goals, the leading NATO countries are supporting the far-right nationalists and neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Those who will never forget the people of Crimea and Sevastopol for freely making a choice to reunite with Russia. They will undoubtedly try to bring war to Crimea, just as they have done in Donbass, to kill innocent people. Just as the members of the punitive units of Ukrainian nationalists and Hitler's accomplices did during the Great Patriotic War. So a couple of things that you might not have considered about Ukraine that you really need to consider in the conversation that's going on right now. Number one, Ukraine is not a bastion of freedom and democracy. In fact, in the last few weeks, opposition leaders have been arrested. Three different opposition TV stations have been shut down. There is a lot going on there that does not represent democracy. But there are a couple of factors that you need to know about when it comes to the United States and our involvement in Ukraine. And the first of those goes back to 2014. Consider the fact that the last time that Ukraine was actually a democracy was when the United States got involved after the democratic election of Ukraine's president. The United States helped to foment a color revolution in order to overthrow the democratically elected leadership of Ukraine. And instead, the United States under the Obama administration installed a puppet leader who would represent the West. By the way, there are recordings of Victoria Nuland, US President Barack Obama's central agent overseeing that coup. 
at least during the month of February 2014 when it climaxed, and she was crucial not only in overthrowing the existing Ukrainian government, but in selecting and installing its rabidly anti-Russian replacement. Victoria Newland was caught on recordings talking about overthrowing the government and deciding which leader would take over instead of Yanukovych. This is all fact and it's all history. The second issue is the Minsk agreements. In 2014 and 2015, there were agreements between Russia and Ukraine about what to do about this Donbass region. That's the area of Ukraine that's been in the news a lot in the last couple of days. The Minsk II agreement signed in 2015 agreed that the Donbass region would be returned to Kiev's control while ensuring the safety and the rights of the area's citizens, as many as 800,000 people, by the way, of whom many have received Russian passports, about 20 to 40 percent of that population. But here's the problem here. Ukraine never bothered to actually implement the Minsk II agreements. And in fact, it was the United States once again that told the government of Kiev to just ignore those Minsk II agreements and not to worry about them. And then the third issue is the issue of NATO. According to some new cables from the CIA that have been released by WikiLeaks, we now know that the CIA knew that they were actually enticing the Russians to take some kind of military action by continually talking about Ukraine joining NATO. Ukraine and Georgia's NATO aspirations not only touch a raw nerve in Russia, they engender serious concerns about the consequences for stability in the region. Not only does Russia perceive encirclement and efforts to undermine Russia's influence in the region, but it also fears unpredictable and uncontrolled consequences which would seriously affect Russian security interests. In that eventuality, Russia would have to decide whether to intervene, a decision Russia does not want to have to face. And yet the CIA and the Pentagon and the United States government has continued to push the idea of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. In fact, in the last few weeks, as the buildup to this uh, Russian military action has been taking place, Russia has continually asked the United States and NATO for a guarantee that Ukraine would not be given membership. The United States, President Biden himself, has refused to do so. And so the bottom line here is that when you call for the United States to get involved in Ukraine, or well maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but for the last 10 years, the United States has been involved in Ukraine and it's the US involvement that seems to have gotten us to this point. As a report from Ben Swan, it's a couple of parts I don't really agree with. I agree with his theme. I don't agree with the limitation of his theme to being it's the United States doing this because it's George Soros doing it. It's NATO doing it. It's the UK who's like, there's a multinational group uh, that's puppeteering over there. And it didn't just start. He's right about all those things. He just told me he's right about that, but to assign it like the United States is over now. Yes. That's Biden over there cutting deals to his Burisma, point, yeah, right? Yeah. Burisma, uh, son of a bitch, I, he's fired on the Council on Foreign Relations stage when Biden says that whole thing yeah. about basically we're not going to give you the billion dollars. We've played that clip numerous times. Yeah. I understand all that. But like Biden's not the representative. He's not carrying out foreign policy on behalf of America. He's doing it on behalf of the handlers on the other end of that special relationship. And it's like a leash, that special relationship. And you might be into a little leather and zippers and s m if you're into that special relationship that they got going on because that's pretty much how it works how it works he's not he's on the you know the end of the leech that's close to the ground is is where is where he's at and uh you know the to facts be, are, to be yeah, focused ahead. on yes uh, people in ukraine that are in the midst of this I, my heart goes out to you dude because that's fucked up but the countries that are playing on the outside it's like you know Putin is friendly toward Klaus's kind of agenda because he plays in the banking network to an extent where he just got cut off and it's supposed to hurt him. So it's not like he was completely outside of that system. If not all the banks, off. though. Right. OK. Right. So and he might have seen this rise against him coming because Ukraine, like to get NATO that close to Russia. You know, uh, how has NATO grown since it was implemented and what yeah, has happened since the out. 90s? And if you're Oops, if you're Putin watching here. it in slow motion, like he's been there a long time, he had to make a point where he's like, OK, this is far enough. And he drew a line in the sand. And that was earlier this week. So we have 1949. If you look at the, the dark regions, 1949, right? 1952, he incorporates uh, what is this over here? Greece Wasn't and Turkey NATO there to protect that? us from communism, Tony? And now we're communist, and now over there they're kind of not like what the heck they happened with NATO? It, or they got to use the, the the United States as the bulldog.
Uh, so why did the U.S. back a violent coup in Ukraine against an elected government? Why did the U.S. and EU support neo-Nazi milita- militias? Why were they silent about the attacks on Russia speaking civilians in Donbass? Why haven't any of these questions been asked by the cheerleading Western media? And so I'll just show you one more video. This is from the Adam United Schiff. United States aids Ukraine and her people so that we can fight Russia over there and we don't have to fight Russia here. So we've been uh, uh, arming and funding uh, the people fighting Russia and uh, breaking the Minsk Accords in Donbass uh, since 2014 at least. And here's what you say. Again, people don't ever focus on this either. Biden rejected Russian offers to keep Ukraine neutral and help sabotage the Minsk Accords, which could have prevented this war. Since he's now hanging Ukraine out to dry, perhaps Kiev can hire Hunter Biden for $80,000 a month for his expertise on how to navigate his dad's crisis. So um, let me bring in Aaron. Before I do, I just want to just show you this. So again, this is the thing nobody ever talks about. Uh, I was there, NATO and the origins of the Ukraine Ukraine crisis. After the fall of the Soviet Union, I told the Senate that expansion will lead us to where we are today. And who said that? Jack F. Matlock Jr. That's a guy who was there when it happened. And he says his Putin's demand is that the process of adding new members to NATO cease and that Russia has assurance that Ukraine and Georgia will never be members. President Biden has refused to give such assurance, but made clear his willingness to continue discussing questions of strategic stability in Europe. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian government has made it clear it has no intention of implementing the agreement reached in 2015 for reuniting the Donbass province into Ukraine with a large degree of local autonomy. An agreement with Russia, Germany and France that was endorsed by the United States. So that's what's led us to here. And you didn't hear any of that in any of those two critiques I just showed you. And I'll show you one more video and I'll bring in Aaron Mate. Uh, Here's Chomsky talking about this. The question that we ought to be asking ourselves is why did NATO even exist after 1990? Throughout the whole history of the Cold War, we were told NATO is necessary to defend Western Europe from the Russian hordes. Okay? No more Russian hordes. What happens to NATO? It expands. Okay? It expands to the east. Its mission changed. Its official mission now is not to defend Europe from the Russian hordes. It's to control the global energy system, sea lanes and pipelines, and to serve as a U.S.-run intervention force. Well, you know, we're all educated intellectuals. But we can now ask a question. What was the nature of the propaganda we were fed all those years? I mean, if Russia, if NATO was there to defend the West from the Russians, why is it now expanding right to the borders of Russia, becoming a global inter- U.S. intervention force, uh, protecting sea lanes and pipelines and so on? What that tells us is all the talk about the Cold War was just a pure lie. And there's plenty more evidence for that, which you can go into. Uh, educated intellectuals don't pursue this line of thought, but it's a pretty obvious one. Well, going on to Ukraine, Mersheimer's point is that you, for any Russian leader, whoever it might be, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Ukraine is right at the core of their geostrategic concerns. Uh, for Ukraine to be taken into NATO, which is what is repeatedly threatened, would be a very serious threat to uh, Russian security, uh, uh, quite apart from historical interests, which go way back to the origins of the Russian Empire, in fact. So yeah, the, you can give arguments against uh, Russian uh, interference in eastern Ukraine uh, after the coup that took place there, but it's a complicated story, and the West is not without its uh, significant uh, initiatives there. Kick it off tonight. Let's go to Luke Radowski. He's going to give us a little survey of the landscape before we get into the uh, the deep divey type material. We'll be right back. Okay, let's separate the clothes. Ouch. So much clumps here. It's probably Chelsea and her cooking. Now we need to add the wet ingredients, so we need the egg. 
<laughs> you know, with memes going around like that on the internet right now, you know the situation is very serious in Europe. Ready for something crazy? If you spent time in the standard American school system from kindergarten through high school, you've spent 15,000 hours of your precious life in a classroom. Shocking. But yet, look at where we're at. Many of us feel totally ill-equipped to function in this crazy, overwhelming, hyper-competitive world. We get anxiety at the prospect of adulting, and entrepreneurship totally just feels like a pipe dream. This is the thing. I found a resource that has made the hugest world of difference for me and my journey of confidence, self-reliance, and success in an unpredictable world. It's called 19 Skills for Success That School Never Taught You. It's a free resource that I consider to be totally priceless and has taught me many of the skills I need to know to be flexible and to succeed in a world full of uncertainty. Who knows what the next few years could bring? I believe that you were made for more. And if you could succeed without these tools for self-reliance, wouldn't you have done it already? Uh -huh.